eating the gross food or the fatty foods, drinking the things of the king, or staying strict to their diet of how they had felt God had called them to live. And that particular diet included mostly vegetables and water. And when they got there, they asked for the vegetables and water. They stood up to the king. They decided who they were going to be. And they said, for better or worse, if we die or if we go back to slavery or if we are oppressed or if we succeed, we are going to follow the God that we follow. Amen. And it said there in Daniel 1.8, that key verse, it says that Daniel made up his mind who he was going to be. He made up his mind how he was going to live. And I submit to you, and I think you would agree, that you and I have the choice to react to the things that come to us in this life and just hope that everything works out. And, and one day hope at the end of our life we were the person we hoped we would be. Or we can make up our mind who we are going to be. And we can live by that. If you want to call it a code for your life, if you want to call it the rules of God, if you want to call it in the will of God, but however you want to frame it for where you are at right now, but we can make up our mind who we're going to be and live according to that principle and keep our integrity and be a person of character, a person of character that doesn't, that doesn't diminish, but in fact it grows and it strengthens. That's the story we see as we get to the book of Daniel. Today we're going to be in Daniel chapter 2, and the story continues, and in fact, many of these first chapters have stories within the, the bigger story. The chapters are kind of like, he wrote, he sat down later in life and remembered events, and we chaptered them, and now we got one event, two events, three events, four, on and on and on. Now what happens, Daniel is serving. He and his buddies, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they've been following God's diet, they've been following God's rules, they have been practicing their relationship with their creator the way that God had told them to do through Old Testament law and covenant, and they are living that out, although they are in the king's court. They are being as submissive as they can to the king, yet standing up to be the people that they should be. And it says here that the king has this dream, and he cannot understand it, and he can't interpret it, so he, he calls for his magicians, it says in Daniel 2, his enchanters his sorcerers, his astrologers, and he demands that they come and, and they tell him what the dream is. They interpret the dream, and the king says, this is a very troubling dream. Well, all the enchanters and the sorcerers and the magicians show up, and they say, okay, king. They say, tell, tell us your dream, and then we'll interpret it. And the king says, oh, no, you don't. You're just trying to buy some time. You're just trying to get the skinny on the dream and you can make up whatever you want. He says, no, you tell me the dream and you tell me what it means. If you are all of that, if you are who you say you are. And of course they get there and they can't do it. And it says here in Daniel chapter 2 verse 5 and Daniel says to his, or the king says to his astrologers, if you don't tell me my dream and what it means you will be torn limb from limb and your houses will be demolished in the heaps of rubble. If you cannot interpret my dream, if you can't tell me, the king says, then what do I need you for? And I am not only going to destroy your house and your family, but I'm going to destroy you personally. And he says even very graphically, limb from limb is how you'll be torn. <coughs> Death is on the horizon for these guys because they cannot figure it out. It goes on to say that not only the astrologers and the sorcerers, but he lumps in the others who are in that, and he lumps into that Daniel and his friends. It says in verse 14, when Daniel heard about the situation, or the king was furious when he heard what happened, and he sent orders to execute the wise men of Babylon. Daniel and his friends were among this group. Now, I'm almost done with the backstory, but you've got to hear the story or you don't know what's going on. It wasn't just like they were in the court one day and they were hanging out watching ESPN and the king had something bad happen and he called them to come in and fix a little problem and if they didn't, it was going to be a shame on you moment. This was life and death, and not only life and death for one person, but life and death for all of them, and their families, their houses. Word gets to Daniel, and Daniel says, well, I can figure this out. I can go. And look what it says in verse 14. And Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, came to kill them. I mean, it was over. They were at the end of the end of the rope. This morning, as we dive into the story just a little deeper, 
I want to ex explore how do we be keep our character? How do we remain people of character when we are at the end of the end? When we are in trouble? When trials come into your life and you think it is it? Is it one thing to keep your character when everything is well and you just got a bonus at work and the family's all doing fine and everybody's healthy? It's one thing to be a person of integrity then. But it's a totally different thing to be a person of integrity when the world not only comes crashing at you, but you think it is over and in fact it might be over. James chapter 1 speaks to this when James says this. We read it last week. Consider it, he says. Pure joy, my brothers, or my brothers and sisters. Whenever trouble comes your way, let it be an opportunity for joy. For when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow, for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be stronger in character and ready for anything. So how do we truly consider it joy? When trials and troubles and tribulations and hurt and pain and sickness and death and poverty come into our lives. When we are broken and people around us are broken and we think it is the end. How do we let that be a moment of joy? Because it's one thing to say it in the context of church. Oh, God will be our joy. Oh, yeah, amen, amen. And then when we get out there, there's no 50 people around you to encourage you with words of scripture. How do we let that be a moment of joy? I want to show you, I think, Daniel's pattern for this. And here it is. It says in verse 14 in Daniel chapter 2 that when Ariok the commander came he, to kill them, listen to this. Daniel handled the situation with wisdom and discretion. And he asked Ariok, why has the king issued such a decree? And Ariok told him why. And Daniel went at once to see the king, and he requested some time so that he could tell the king what the dream meant. Here it is. Hey, king, I'll stick out my neck on the line. Forget killing everybody. Put the machetes away. Put the guillotines away. Don't hang anybody. Here I am. I will take care of this. And I want to say, first and foremost, that the pattern in Scripture, when there is some trouble, when there is a mess to be involved in, the pattern in Scripture is that those who seek after the heart of God hear that, not as a time to mourn, not as a time to run, not as a time to be scared, not as a time to put everybody down, not as a time to leave their God, but as a time that they hear it as a call to serve. Daniel hears that the king is greatly troubled. He hears that not only himself, but all of his peers are going to be slaughtered. And he says, king, sign me up. I will be here. I will not just stand in the gap. I will be here to serve you, king. And in fact, if I can't do it, Things will probably be worse. But I will be the one that when trouble comes, it's a call to serve. When trouble comes in our life, it's a call to look around and see maybe who else might be in more trouble. Who else might need a hand? Who might need us to step in on their behalf? Remember that story in Luke chapter 10? There's a story, we call it the story of the Good Samaritan. I won't read the whole thing to you. I think most of you are vaguely familiar with the story, if not more. But it says that this Jewish man was traveling on a trip from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he was attacked by, by bandits. He was not only beat up and robbed, but he was left, it says, for dead. And it says in my Bible that, that, first of all, a Jewish priest comes along, and he looks at the man, and he looks the other way. He goes on by. It's a moment when someone is in need, when someone is... At the end, at the end, at the end of their rope, when someone's life is on the line, and here comes a man who says he is after the heart of God, and he doesn't hear that as a call to serve, but he sees that as a moment to keep walking. Lack of character, lack of integrity, lack of understanding the heart of God. He goes on to say a temple assistant, another supposedly religious person walked over and looked at him lying there, but he too also passed by. When things are tough, when someone's life is in a mess or on the line or around God, are we the people who keep walking by? Are we the people who do what the next guy did? Verse 33, a despised Samaritan came along. And when he saw the man, he felt deep pity. And kneeling beside him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with medicine and bandaged them. And he put the man on his donkey and he took him to the inn and he took care of him. And he paid for a, for a trip until he came back to see him again. The Good Samaritan 
is the story of a man with a heart after the heart of God who didn't claim to be religious, but who lived out God's mercy and God's compassion and God's love, who heard and saw someone suffering as a moment to serve. And that's where Daniel was in his life. It's a moment to serve. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was quoted speaking about that Luke chapter 10 verse passage, and he said this, The first question that the priest and the Levite asked is, If I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? But the Good Samaritan reversed the question and said, If I, don't, if I do not stop to help this man, what will happen to him? We are followers of Jesus after the heart of our Creator God who loved us and poured out His mercy and His forgiveness and His compassion upon us. We are to be the people who see someone's trouble and don't say, well, what's going to happen if I stop? But to, to have that, that tugging on our heart to say, what will happen if I don't stop? What will happen if I don't get involved? And that's where Daniel was in this moment. He could have just went ahead and died with everybody else, I guess. He could have just tried to run off, or he could have tried to argue with the king and try to buy some time. But he says, you know what? If I don't do this, a lot of people's lives on the line. So he stepped in the gap. And he stepped up, and he heard that as a call to serve. He goes on down and says that he asked his friends in the next verse, verse 17. Daniel went home, and he told his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. That was their other names for... Uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, thank you. It says in verse 18, listen to this. Now, they're all about to die. And Daniel not only is about to die, but now he's stuck his neck out on the line, and he's going to die first, or die harshest. And it says he urged them to ask the God of heaven, to show them by his mercy by telling them the secret, so that they would not be executed along with the other Wise man. Not only did he see this as a chance or a call to serve, but when he saw his life was on the line, the king's life was in distress, all these other people had problems and trials and tribulations, what does he do? <coughs> Sign me up, and then he hits his knees to pray. You catch that? He didn't have superhuman powers. He wasn't gifted for, as a young boy to interpret these dreams. And he said, well, I know I've got this one in my back pocket because that's what I can do. It wasn't like they said, hey, you know, we're going to kill everybody unless there's a violin player. And Daniel just happened to be a violin player. He said, I'll do it. And then he runs back to his house and he gathers his friends and he says, we're going to do this, but we're going to do it with the help of God. And we're going to hit our knees and we are going to pray and ask God to, to pour out his mercy. We don't deserve it. We're going to beg for it and plead for it. And that's exactly what happens as he sees this problem, this trial, as a, as a chance to hit his knees, as a, as a chance to pray. Amen. This is also a pattern all through Scripture that people of integrity who follow the heart of God not only see suffering and trials of themselves and others as a chance to serve, but they also find that as the moment that they are called to pray. To hit our knees, to, to cry out before God. Acts chapter 12, there's a little story. It's not really a little story, but it's a good story. Peter is in prison. You remember this? Peter was placed on trial. He was asleep and he was chained between two soldiers with the other standing guard at the prison gate. Suddenly there was a bright light in the cell and the angel of the Lord stood before Peter. And the angel tapped him on the side and awakened him and said, quick, get up. And the chains fell off his wrist. The angel said, get dressed and put on your sandals, put on your coat, and we'll just call it this. They took off. Amen. So it says right before that in chapter 12, verse 5. But while Peter was in prison, it doesn't say the church protested, although maybe that would have been appropriate. It doesn't say they had a stand-in outside, although maybe that would have been appropriate. It doesn't say they marched. Doesn't say they got the right gear on and went down. You want to know what it says? It says, while Peter was in prison, the church prayed very earnestly for him. When someone is at the end, when someone is in trial, whether you or someone else, it is a chance to serve. It's a chance to step in, but it's also a call to prayer. Not to rely on our own resources and our own connections. What do we do when we're in trouble? We think, who do I know that can know somebody that will know somebody that will help me get out, right? That's how we think. 
Who do I know? Who, who should I write a letter to that has enough pull? What do these guys do? These men of integrity, these people of integrity, people of character that love and follow their God. They said that we're just going to get on our knees and talk to our God. It's a chance to pray. Not to try to prove how powerful we are, how superior we are, how extraordinary. When we come into trials, Mother Teresa said this about prayer. You guys know Mother Teresa. She might have taken an opportunity or two to serve in her life, or maybe in her whole life. And she said this, prayer is not asking. Prayer is putting oneself in the hands of God at his disposition and listening to his voice in the depth of our hearts. Amen. Trials and tribulations be the ones that say, I'm going to serve. If it's trials on you, serve someone else. It'll get the focus off of you and your problems. You can stand up and you can serve someone else. You can take care of someone else. You can help out. When the trial's on you or someone else, don't try to do it yourself, though. Be the person who gets down before God and says, God, just speak into me. Your will and your way, excuse me, who you are. And that's exactly what Daniel and his friends did. Long story short, Daniel tells the king exactly what the dream was. And this wasn't like, you read this when you get home, okay? It wasn't like, oh, you dreamed that there was a, a giant gorilla chasing you. I mean, I mean this, this wasn't like just a, some out there one-time dream. It was like very detailed down to this, what this figure was made out of and clay and copper and all this iron. Not only did he tell him the dream, which the king probably couldn't remember all the details himself. And now Daniel spits back the details to him exactly, but then it says that he interprets the dream. And as he interprets the dream, it's not very favorable to the king. It's about his kingdom falling and kingdoms that will come later. And, and finally, that God will set up a kingdom that reigns. It says here in verse of Daniel 2, verse 45. The great God has shown your majesty what will happen in the future, and this dream is true, and its meaning is certain. That's how Daniel ended it. He says, here I am. I gave you the dream, and God delivered not only the dream, but the interpretation. And he says to the king, I guarantee you that it's true. You can stamp it true, because my God gave it to me. And listen to this. King Nebuchadnezzar bowed down to the ground before Daniel, and he worshipped him, and he commanded his people to offer sacrifices and burn sweet incense before him. And the king said to Daniel, Truly your God is the God of gods, the Lord over kings, a revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal the secret. Truly your God is the God. Here is a king who worshipped a multitude of gods, who, who, lit, who made sacrifices and and gave gifts to God's little G of all sorts. Who had no respect for the God of Daniel, Yahweh. But after this moment, he bows down and he says, Surely your God is the God of all gods. Amen. The Lord of all kings. When we find trouble, when we find persecution, when we find tribulation, it is in fact a moment to serve. It is in fact a call to pray, but it is also a chance to see God praised Amen. for the outcome of what he does and how he works in situations. Now, I want to show you a little twist in the scripture. Maybe some of you caught it. But it says here in verse 46, King Nebuchadnezzar bows down before Daniel and begins to worship him. And then it says in verse 47 that the king says, God, Daniel, your God is God. Something happens between verse 46, where the king is bowing down to Daniel, and in verse 47, when the king is giving praise to God. Something happens, and some of your Bibles say in verse 47, the king answers Daniel. Mine says a different. It says the king said to Daniel, but I think the literal translation there is the king answered Daniel and said, truly your God is the God of God. And what seems to be the case is just exactly this, that the king bows down to Daniel and says, oh, Daniel, you are... You're it. And Daniel says, whoa, hold on, wait a minute. It's not me. It's him. I didn't do it. God delivered. And between those verses it says, then the king answered back to Daniel and said, okay then, your God is the God of all gods. His God made himself famous. He did the work. 
Here's the rub. We have this moment to serve because of trials, tribulations in life. And it's a call to pray and let God show up and do his work. It's so vitally important to keep our character and our integrity and our relationship with God intact by not taking the credit for what happened, but by saying, you know what? It was God. Not a false humility. We all, we've all seen this. We've all done this. Oh, yeah, it wasn't me. It was God. But go ahead and keep patting me on my back, right? Go ahead and keep telling me how great I was. But it was God. It was not God. Not one of those. Just saying, truly, I'm blown away. That God allowed me to be a part of this moment. That God did what he did, I'm blown away. That I was somehow even involved in it because I don't deserve it. That's the attitude and that's the action. And that was the life of Daniel in that moment. And when trouble comes his way, he points the credit back to God. And it becomes an opportunity to praise. Amen. Philippians chapter 2, verse 10. Almost as if it was written for all the kings who are arrogant and greedy. That will someday come to be humbled before the Lord their God. Philippians 2.10 So that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow. In heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. The end of the story when God is involved is that his name is lifted up and that his name is praised. Consider it pure joy. My Bible said there in James, it said it just a little bit different. Dear brothers and sisters, whenever trouble comes your way, let it be an opportunity for joy. For when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow, so let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be strong in character. Ready for anything. Amen. Why should we be joyful in the worst circumstances and moments of our life? Because we know we serve a God if we so choose to. Amen. That we serve a God that can use those moments to build our character. Amen. To strengthen our faith. I didn't say succeed. I didn't say necessarily overcome. I said build our character and strengthen our faith. And a God who can lift his name up Amen. so that others can see his glory and Amen. experience his love. Amen. So when it comes crashing in on us, we can say, God, I don't understand it, but I'm going to hit my knees and ask you to do something about it that will make you great. Amen. Show your love. I want to ask you to bow your heads with me just for a moment.